Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of When the Cleats Come Off podcast. I have a special guest today, and I don't think she needs any introduction. If you guys are on social media, you should know who this human being is. Her name is Hannah Huseman, and just to give her a little bit of a background, she played at the University of Tennessee Chattanooga. She actually started off playing basketball and then continued her career in softball, so she'll probably share that in a little bit with you guys, but she is now currently the mental skills coach for the Phillies, hence the Phillies hat. You guys will probably never see this on my head again, but she is well <laughs> worth it. Thank you so much, Hannah, for being on the podcast today. Hey, Ashley, thank you so much for having me. I am excited to talk about all the things. <laughs> I know. I told, I told her beforehand, I have like 45 questions planned, but you know what? Probably not going to get to half of them. Um, <laughs> maybe 44. <laughs> yeah, maybe 44. But I'm just excited to just sit down with you because what I've learned is we are very similar. <laughs> we grew up playing all the sports. Uh, we ended up choosing, you know, we ended up choosing softball in the end. Um, but we also had this fun and exciting experience, you know, starting out in an exercise sports realm with our undergrad and then loving sports psychology and all of the aspects in that. So before we dive too deep into our conversation, if you could just give our audience a little bit of a background on, you know, where you grew up, how you grew up, you know, and how you basically eventually got into your dream role that you're in right now. Yeah. So like you said, born and raised in Nashville, Tennessee, actually, and went right up the road to Chattanooga um, to play basketball and then switch over to softball, which is super unique. But um, yeah, played sports my whole life. I actually have a younger brother, Hunter, who is 21 months younger than me, so a little shy of two years. So we're super competitive um, and grew up fighting and arguing and clawing for everything we could get. I mean, from Monopoly to, you know, pickup game at, at night when it was dark outside. So the competitiveness was always ingrained in our brains and our parents are super competitive too. So I've always loved that and always had a hard time talking to people who aren't competitive, but hey, we work on it, you know? And so I always knew I wanted to be in the sport world to some capacity, just really didn't know what. Like I always knew that sports was where I was most confident at, was where I was most enthusiastic about and what truly made me happy. And I always knew from a young age that whatever I was gonna do, like I was gonna love because I saw whether it was grandparents or aunts or uncles or whoever, whatever, um, close friends and families of our family, it was like so many people doing jobs that they literally hated and like would come home and just be drained and exhausted and not happy and like just doing it for the paycheck. And I was like, I don't know why, but from a young age, I realized like, no, like no way am I going to do something that I hate and live this life. And, and I get some people can't. And, but that was just something that was a very high priority for me. So I was always in search for what kind of sport career I could have and um, ended up getting my undergrad in exercise science like you and took a sports psychology class, you know, thought I was going to be a strength and conditioning coach, thought I was going to be a softball or basketball coach or something. And then took sports psych and was like, are you kidding? Like, what is this? How have we never heard about this? Why don't we have a mental performance coach, a sports psychologist, whatever. Um, and how can I learn everything I can about it? So I went and talked to the professor and I mean, for like two hours, we had a conversation. She told me about her background and that there were lost some master's programs for sports psychology. So literally went home that night, started doing research, found the University of Tennessee, which was again, kind of right up the road from Chattanooga, about an hour and a half. And like, I think I applied like within the week and um, ended up getting in and it was like, almost like it was just meant to be. And so as soon as I graduated undergrad, I had a normal summer off and then I went straight back into school um, to get my master's and got my master's in sports psychology and motor behavior, which as you know, um, is a really fancy way of saying how the mind and the body work together to produce optimal performance. And from there I had an intern, I had a couple internships while I was getting my degree. And then as soon as I graduated, I had my first internship was with the Pittsburgh Pirates um, post-graduation. And so that's kind of how I got my foot in the door with baseball. And then um, it was such an awesome internship, but they weren't hiring full time. And I was kind of at the point in my career where it was like, Hey, got to go make some money, got to go uh, do something. And so I actually moved to New York City and did the same mental performance coaching, but for a private practice and worked with all types of performers. So not just athletes, um, actors, actresses, business people, firefighters. It was really cool. Um, really, really cool. Stretched my knowledge and outside of my comfort zone of sports, like I said. 
And, um, but it also solidified that I really, really like working in a team capacity. And so I started looking for baseball jobs again, had a few interviews and ended up um, landing the gig with the Phillies. And this is year number three with them right now. If you call this a year with the coronavirus, but it's still a year. Um, yeah. So yeah. It still counts still somehow. Yeah, it counts. Yeah. Oh, it counts. So yeah. I love the hat. You can wear it as much as you want when I'm around and when I'm not around, please continue to wear it. <laughs> you bet. You bet. Yeah. So just backstory for those who don't know, my dad grew up in Pennsylvania, huge Phillies fan. He, so I grew up a Cubs fan, um, but because my mom and, and we live, you know, so close to Chicago. And so my dad, he was always like watching the Phillies. I'm just like, like, what is it? Like, what is it about the Phillies? And he's just like, well, you know, and he would just like go on and on about it. And so um, I don't even know how I ended up with this hat to be completely honest, but <laughs> I do like it. I mean, I'm a hat girl. But we're so. happy you did. Yeah. yeah you we bet. Anytime I we talk to it. you, I'll make sure I'm wearing the hat. <laughs> Please do. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. So I think I'm just so excited to meet with you today because there's like this stigma about mental performance and, mm -hmm. and, you know, I think I want you a little bit to describe the difference between mental skills and mental health, because mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people think they're the same thing and you and I both know that's not the case. So mm -hmm. if you could just shed a little bit of light on the difference yeah. between the two um, and how maybe you're seeing it with some of the athletes that you're working with right now. Yeah. So I love that that's like out of the gate, one of the opening questions, because I always love to educate people on the difference because there is such a stigma, right? It's always been for years on end, like if you go to the sports psychologist or the mental person, like something's way off, like you're something's wrong. You got to go get fixed, like run, like don't even think about it. Just go run to them. And to some extent that's right. Right. Cause you have mental health and you have mental performance, like you said. And so I am a mental performance coach, which means I solely work on the mental performance side of things. And so what is that? Right. That's basically anything on field that can affect your playing time or your play, your game, your game time, your performance, anything that will affect it from a mental standpoint. So confidence, composure, concentration, right? Focus training, um, enjoyment, motivation, resiliency, right? All of those things, basically anything that could affect your performance on the field is what I deal with, uh, obviously mentally. Um, and then where mental health is more your clinical anxiety, your depression, um, eating disorder, suicidality, right? More of the heavy hitting stuff that is more predominantly off the field based stuff. And so it's, it's unique, right? Because mental performance is more helping people just like normal coaches, like coaches help you get a better swing, coaches help you be better at pitching, change grips, et cetera, et cetera, right? We help you become stronger mentally, right? It's the same thing. Whereas mental health is more of, we have to fix something, right? Like you are depressed. We need to, we need to go to see a doctor. We need to get you on medication. We need to get you on remedies, whatever it is. Um, it is more of fixing a problem. Whereas mental performance doesn't mean you have a problem, right? Just because you go, right. You don't just go to a hitting coach. If you have a problem, right. You go to a hitting coach to see how you can get better. Right. Mm -hmm. And how you can continue being successful. Hey, I'm doing something right. What am I doing? Right. It's the same with mental performance coaching, right? You don't necessarily just go see them when you have a problem. You can, right, to get a few adjustments here and there. But sometimes you go to them and you're like, hey, I'm doing really well. How can I keep getting better? How can I keep growing? And that's, that's the main people that I work with are the people who are constantly trying to make their game better and get better and continue to grow. And they want to make sure they're not just growing physically and getting stronger physically, but they're growing and getting stronger mentally. And so such a huge difference. Um, and there are people in the field who do both which is, I think, what causes most of the confusion because there are, you know, some clinical psychologists who do mental performance coaching too, or some sports psychologists who do mental health work too. Um, but me specifically, I am only in the realm of mental performance. So typically, um, mental performance coaches are trained to notice, okay, like this nervousness on the field is actually turning into some debilitating anxiety. And so we refer out. And like, obviously, in Major League Baseball, you have a whole referral system and any, we, typically most mental performance coaches have an awesome referral system to get, to get that athlete, whatever help they need, um, whether it is mental performance or mental health, but there is a big difference. And I like to say I'm on the lighthearted, more fun side of the spectrum. Um, and so we can, we can destigmatize it just by being like, Hey, everyone meets with the mental skills coach. Nothing has to be wrong. You don't have to fix anything. We're just checking in. We're making sure you're getting better. And if you want to get better, you can come talk to a mental skills coach. So a big part of what I do is destigmatizing it, making it a part of the culture and making it the norm 
that it's almost weird if you don't go talk to a mental performance coach. Like, just like it would be weird if you didn't go to a strength and conditioning coach to get stronger or you, you don't use the hitting coach, right? Like that's weird. Right. And so we're trying to get it to where like, you don't go talk to Hannah, like you don't go talk to the mental performance coach. Why not? Right. And so it's, it's coming along. It's coming. It's way better than it has been. Um, and I think it's an ongoing process, but we're getting there, but you're right. It starts with knowing the difference between mental health and mental performance. Yeah, totally. And you know, it's funny. I try to find like the best segue, but to be honest, in, in college, we had a sports psychologist. We had someone that we could go and talk to, but I was actually told in college that I couldn't meet with him. Um, and I don't know why, maybe it was just because on the field, I was doing exactly what the coaches wanted me to do. And they're like, well, you don't need anyone. You don't need anyone. Mm -hmm. And then it was actually playing professionally. So the first year I go play pro, um, I came back and actually coached as a volunteer assistant at Purdue, um, during that off season, which is like a nine month off season. So mm -hmm. I actually just started meeting with the sports psychologist be because I had sparked an interest in college with sports psychology and how it's, it, it made a huge difference in my game, difference in my game. I think I was hitting around 400 my senior year and I completely mm -hmm. attested to that class, like straight up. Um, and so because I was like, this is so important. I just want to learn more. I started meeting with the sports psychologist at Purdue at that time. And I was like, why am I being told in college not to meet with this guy? Like he is only there to help. He is only there to help take where you are and just help you thrive. Yeah. And, you know, from, from then on, I was like, if y'all aren't meeting with Dr. Carr, y'all have problems. <laughs> <laughs> Because, because if you think you can do this on your own, why, like, why do it on your own? If you could have somebody holding your hand and telling you, you know, what's the next best step to take. Um, so with that, what type of questions you think are most common that maybe some of the athletes you work with now come up with or come to you with? Um, and then what are your responses to help them with those issues? Yeah. So, um, just ballpark, you know, some of the, uh, one of the main questions is, and they don't frame it this way, but usually like a lot of what they're saying stems under this. And it's all about like, how do we deal with things that are outside of our control? Right. So whether it's, Hey, the empire screwing me or, Hey, I'm not moving up fast enough or, Hey, this guy got promoted and I didn't, or, um, you know, there's stuff going on at home that is stressing me out, you know, whatever it is, it's like 95% of the time it's outside of their control and there's truly nothing they can do about it right now, right here. And so it's really trying to help them see that and build awareness around that without, um, I don't know, without them feeling like super bad about not being able to do anything about it. Right. So instead of saying like, Hey, you can't do anything about this. It's more like, what can you do about this situation? And then figuring out like not a whole lot, but maybe there's one or two things they can do. And so let's spend all of this time and energy and effort that you're giving to this whole scene, this whole picture into that one or two specific things. That way, like you're not wasting all of this time and energy and effort and, and who you are to something that you literally can't change, but here's what you can do about it. And let's give it all to that. Um, and that, I mean, that's, um, seriously, that's a huge piece because majority of what stresses us out, what makes us nervous, what makes us happy, sad, mad, angry, all of the emotions is typically outside of our control. And there's so little that we can actually do and actually control. And it's a big piece is trying to figure out how do we channel all of our stuff into those things instead of get lost in the sauce of all the things that we can do literally nothing about. Mm -hmm. Um that's a huge one that, that's, that, that comes up on a daily basis, pretty much. Yeah. That's the first one that comes to mind. Yeah. And working with youth athletes, the umpires are probably the biggest thing out of the athletes and even the coaches and parents control. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I notice a lot of athletes, parents, and coaches just make a huge deal about those things. So what are, what's maybe one tip that, you know, you can give to parents and coaches and athletes that, tend to make too much out of the situation um, when an umpire makes a bad call or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I think my answer is different for parents and um, players, but <laughs> you can um, split it. You can split it. <laughs> yeah. So, well, for my, my go-to answer for parents is, you know, you are setting the example for your kids. So what you get mad about, they're going to get mad about what you get happy about. 
they're going to get happy about. So without a question, there's two things I say to parents all the time. One, consistency is key, right? Don't treat your kid differently because they have a bad game and because they have a good game. Because now, like, regardless of what you think, they're going to start pairing that with how much you love them and how much you support them, right? And so it's like, if you go get a snack after game one, get a snack after game five, regardless of if it's good or bad, right? Don't like, consistency is key. Like we know that you're always going to love them, know that you're always going to support them. Maybe the conversation's a little different, but we're still going to do this. And like, there's no punishment and no reward if you play bad and if you play good. Like I, I, it's a really tricky line and a lot of people don't agree with that, but that's just my piece of advice. One, consistency. Two, make sure you are validating things that they can control. Okay, right? So don't validate the home run, validate the at bat after the strikeout right? I saw you struck out that first time, but the second at bat, you came back and were so focused and locked in and look what happened, right? Validate the things that they actually have control over. So like, hey, I saw you cheering for your teammates today. That was awesome. I saw your effort. I saw you hustling today. Like, I'm really proud of the way you hustled today versus I'm really proud that you went three for four today, right? Because what you make important, they make important. And if you can start training them from a young age to, to, give all that time and energy and effort to the things they can control by the time they get to the big leagues to me, right? We don't have to go back and say, Hey, why are you getting stressed over the umpire? Right? There's nothing you can do about it. So maybe it's like, Hey, you know, we saw that bad call with the umpire, but you were still able to lock it in and go out and make a great play in, in the next outing when you very easily could have given up and been mad, but you didn't good job. Right. And so you're constantly encouraging the acts that they can control. And I think that's invaluable. And I think that's really hard to do as a parent. Um, and I think that's really hard to do as a kid. But again, what you do, they will do. And so then, you, you know, you go to the kid messaging piece and you're like, ask them why they get so upset about a bad call on the ump. This is after you've controlled your, right? Because if they say, because you get mad mom or dad or whoever your guardian is, right? Then you're like, oh, good. I need to take a step back, right? But maybe they'll say, because I'm embarrassed or because he's an idiot or because it cost me an at bat. Right. And, and then just have a conversation around that and then almost try to like, let them see that that's not going to help them take a step forward. In fact, what if, if, if we get mad at the ump, what if that makes our performance worse? Then do we want to get mad at the ump? What if we can learn how to let it go and okay, we know it was a bad call, but if we get mad about it, we're going to play worse. So what is in their control? How they respond to the ump's bad call. So if they respond like, okay, whatever, I'm going to go out and play really good defense or the next at bat, I'm not going to let that call happen, right? Again, putting the control or putting the focus back into something they can control and then almost like telling them that by doing this, you're going to perform better. Whereas if you get mad at the umps, you're probably going to perform worse. And so now are you going to let that um make you play worse? And they're going to be like, no. Right. And like, and so it's almost like turning it into, Hey, we can do this, but what you can do is this. And we want to make sure the way you respond is helping your performance instead of hurting your performance. And by responding negatively to the umpire, the chances of that hurting your performance are really high because it's going to get you off your rocker. It's going to get you more sensitive to the situation you're going to be playing out of emotion instead of playing out of you know trust and enjoyment and all of those things and so it's it's almost just shifting their perspective on their response to whatever that stimulus is that's so good that's so good and i think that just needed to be said because i don't think enough people know that you know you complaining about an umpire you complaining about the weather you complaining about things you can't control it really does affect your performance and Without you know doubt. And, and I don't know if everybody knows that. So if you do not write down notes from today's episode, I think <laughs> you probably should whip out a notebook right now because I'm taking notes like crazy right now. Um, another, always take notes. Always oh, take notes. I mean, you just said you listened to a podcast earlier and you were taking notes. I'm like, I have five journals full of podcast notes and it's seriously, it's seriously the best. I mean, it is yeah. true that if you get things down on paper, you're more likely to remember it and repeat it, right? Right, and, and for sure. And I'm a huge believer in, one, if you're listening to this podcast, you probably listen to other podcasts, right? Because you're a podcaster, but also like you are constantly inundated with information in our world. Whether you're a player, whether you're a coach, whether you're a parent, right? 
you are constantly inundated with information. And not all of it needs to be remembered, but a lot of it does. And I say this all the time with players are like, hey, yeah, I'm going to remember it. And literally a week I will ask them and they, no clue. And it's not, it's not your fault. It's that we have so much information. There's no way to remember all of it. So my, um, my little go-to saying when it comes to journaling or writing notes or whatever is write down something you're going to want to go back and look at and read, right? Don't just write down everything that you hear um, that, that you're just going to throw away that piece of paper in a month when you see it and like, oh yeah, that's that one podcast I listened to. I'm going to throw it away but write down two or three things that you're like, oh my goodness, this is me. I need this. I need to hear this. I need to remember this. Like, that's what you have to write down. Write down the stuff that when you go back and read, you're like, ooh, I needed to read that again, right? Not just like, oh yeah, I know that, I know that. Like, write down the stuff that's like gonna take your breath away almost every time you read it. And you're like, ooh, like that's gonna check you. That's you creating awareness. That's you building accountability for yourself. And, and yep, I wrote this for a reason still true to this day, that kind of thing. So yes, huge note taker. I give journals out to all of my players. Um, I make 18 to 23 year old boys write journals and, and, and I am proud to say that some of them really like it. Some of them hate it at first, but then they come along and they're like, I don't know how I'd remember all of this stuff without it. And I'm like, exactly. You're not supposed to, you're not going to. So <laughs> if we know we're not going to, let's write it down. Like let's have pride and and like wanting to keep track of all of the good information we're getting. Cause sometimes we get overloaded and that's okay. But the way to, you know, not feel shameful about it and not remembering is by writing it down and doing, right. You can control what you write down. You can't necessarily control what you remember and what you don't remember. Mm -hmm. If you want to remember it, you can remember it by writing it down. So literally like, literally 90% of my conversations come back to what can you control and what can you actually do about the things that you can control? You can control note taking, take notes, right? Do the things you can control well. Like do them well, like no excuse to not do them well. I love it. And it's so funny because like it's about a month ago, I uh, signed, I'm actually partnering with a, basically a company that makes journals for baseball and softball players. And I was just like, love it. this is, this is what the world needs. And, and it's perfect that you said that, that it's, it's those that are always searching for more, always searching to become a better version of themselves. They're going to take ownership of journaling. So it was one of those where I was just like, okay, I force you to journal every time after a lesson. Now I'm actually going to give you something to write in to make mm. sure you're doing it. I love um, it. But it is the separator. It's, it's things like that that really separate. Um, and I love that. So because you talked about podcasts and that you love them, I need, I need a reference. Like give me some good podcasts that you listen to. I'm taking notes right now. Um, well, I love the Joe Rogan experience one. And I listen to that because our players love that, um, like love it. Um, so I do that to mostly like relate to them. Mm -hmm. um, I also love Justin Sua's podcast. Um, have you heard that? Have you no, heard that before? No, I haven't. He, I'm excited. So he, yeah, he is a mental performance coach. I believe he's the director of mental performance for the Tampa Bay Rays now. Um, mm -hmm. And he's had a podcast and it's super short. It's like, you know, ranges from two to five minutes. Um, but his is awesome. Um, mm. So that's, that's kind of like a go-to. I think he does them every day too, or every weekday, like Monday through Friday. And they're really mm -hmm. short snippets of it. Um, so those are my first two that pop in the head. Those are, those, those are the ones I listen to on a pre pretty regular basis. That's awesome. Do you like to read? Because I don't like reading, but podcasting is like my type of reading. So I love to read. Okay. I actually prefer reading over podcasts. Really? Um, yeah. Um, and I've like, I've tried to do, um, audio books and I can't, um, my dad crushes audio books, like one a day, one or well, like one every two days. Really? And he's like, listen to this. And I'm like, I cannot like, I can, cause I like writing and highlighting mm. and circling. And so I think I'm more of a like in person, but, um, I actually used to hate podcasts. And, and so I've like try, tried to get on board probably in the last year or so. And so I, but it's, it's, it's something good that you can do when you're multitasking. But mm -hmm. if I have time, like by myself to just read a book, like I'm doing it, I'm doing yeah. that over a podcast, but that's just me. Yeah. I think everybody's different. And there are some books yeah. that I read oh, cover yeah. to cover and loved. And oh, some yeah. of them were toughness by Jay Billis. I really mm -hmm. liked that one. Um, Marie Forleo came out with a book called everything is figure outable. It's like not okay. being like getting confronted with something that you don't think you can conquer, but realizing there's some way to like figure it Love out. It. Love that Love book. It. 
And I did a book club over quarantine for like the best book ever. I know the classic Classic. mind gym. It's like the easiest read to be honest for people that don't like to read. Look at us. I love that. There you go. Um, (laughs) it's like four pages per chapter. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Even if you don't like reading you, if I like it, you can like it. Um, Yeah. So I, I that. great for middle school, high school athletes. I think that's when I first was introduced to Mind Gym was like in high school. Great read for them. Yeah. Sadly, I was in college when I first read it. So I should have read it way before. Um, but yeah, there's also another one. Um, the ment- something of baseball. Um, mental game? Mental game of baseball? Heads up baseball? It. Heads up baseball. That was one that I read in college. Yeah, and that's a good one. Yeah, that was a little longer and harder for me to read, but yeah, mm-hmm. I really like that. More one. of a workbook style too. Yeah, yeah, and My I like how tangible right it is. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. so it, it's it's an easy read, but it's um, long, and there's a lot of pieces. Like you really got to think if you're actually going to implement it, you really got to think about all the little things that they're actually talking about. Um, mm-hmm. Extreme Ownership is a great leadership book. Um, yeah. Oh, my favorite. I recommend it to everybody. I've heard right of now. it. I don't think I've taken it. You need to read it. You need to read it. Anybody that has anything to do with leadership, extreme ownership is awesome. Um, it's by Jocko Willis and somebody else. And Leif Babin, Babin, I don't know. And then Atomic Habits by James Clear is fire. Mm. Yes. Fire. It's a little um, more advanced of a read. Um, maybe high schoolers could do it, but it, it's it's a little more advanced, but I love that book too. I'm so glad you mentioned that book because I was going to ask you about habits and routines and how Mm -hmm. important they are, um, whether you're Mm -hmm. a younger athlete, an older athlete, uh, what are some habits and routines that maybe you're asking your athletes to do, or at least try? Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, crucial, right? Habits and routines are crucial for good performance and it's funny because it's like, you don't really know you need them until you figure out why you need them. And Mm -hmm. I think that's a huge part of mental skills, right? Is right. You have motivation, which is like, what, that's what you want, right? You want to be confident. You want to like go crush this team. You want to like be resilient, right? Which is great. I want you to be those things too. But do you know how, do you know how to be confident? Do you know how to be resilient? Do you know how to get motivated for you? And do you know why, do you know why it's important? And I think the routines and habits are the how and the why of consistency, which is the what, right? So what, like I hear players say this all the time. What do you want to achieve? Well, Hannah, I just want to be more consistent, right? Well, yeah, we all want to be more consistent. So how in the heck are you going to be more consistent? What do you do to be more consistent, right? And so physically they'll say, well, I just, you know, do the same motion over and over again. And I'm like, great. So how do you do that mentally? how do you do the same thing over and over again mentally? And it's a habit or a routine, right? It's doing the same thing over and over again, no matter what the circumstances are, right? So let's say you're a pitcher, right? And you're on the mound and you're throwing, things are going well. Do you change? Do you keep doing what you're doing, right? Do you, do you speed up because things are going well? Do you slow down? Do you start to get a little more cocky, a little more confident? So all of a sudden we've got a little more swagger. And so now we're not being consistent in our routines. And then all of a sudden we get our stuff rocked, right? or vice versa, right? Maybe we're struggling. And so now that we're struggling, do we take more time between pitches? Are we stressing out? Are we trying to rush pitches? Are we looking for out? Are we stressing, right? Are we changing our habits and our routines, right? And it it goes hand in hand with my definition of mental toughness. So if you ask 10 different people of what your definition of mental toughness is, you're going to hear 10 different things, right? And chances are they're all right, because people's definition of mental toughness can vary, right? What your definition of mental toughness is may be different than mine. They're probably close, but it might be a little different, right? So my definition of mental toughness is being able to focus on the right thing at the right time. And if you think about that, like if you really think about that concept, it's a no brainer, right? And it goes back to this, right? If you're playing really well, are you still able to focus on the task at hand, on the things that you can control, on the routine that you should be doing, Or do you get knocked off your rocker? Are you hype? Are you doing weird things? Are you getting a little too air? Whatever it is, right? It's the same concept. And same when you're performing poorly. Are you still able to focus on the task at hand even when all hell's breaking loose around you? Can you still do it, right? And that's incredibly challenging, right? In high stress, like right now talking, you're probably, yeah, I'm pretty good at that. In high stress situations, you're probably not great at it because most of us aren't great at it. Mm -hmm. It's a really hard skill to when everything around you is going crazy, whether for better or for worse, to lock in and focus on what you should be focusing on. Even when things are going right, 
sometimes it's hard to focus on the, the, the task at hand. And so I think all of that comes back into like, right, mental toughness, focusing on the right thing, consistency, focusing on the um, routine that you're supposed to be doing every single time. So if I throw a pitch and it's a strike, get the ball back, do my routine, do my deep breath, do my reset, look at the left foul pole, whatever I'm going to do, get set, go again. If I get a home run hit, I get the ball, reset, look at the left foul pole line, take a deep breath, go again. And here's why it's important because whether it's the first pitch of the game or the last pitch of the ninth inning of the World Series, you have to do the same thing because you're messaging your brain that no matter what the situation, whatever's happening outside, we're doing the same thing inside. Just because there's more pressure on the line doesn't mean I change my performance, right? Or you shouldn't, which maybe that's a hard concept to grasp too. Like, yeah, I do. I got to, like, there's more on the line. I got I to gotta I gotta be more sharp. First of all, if you have to be more sharp when the game's on the line, then you're not being sharp enough when the game's not on the line, right? Facts. Which is like playing down to the uh, opponent's level, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. And so it's regardless of the situation, regardless of the game, whatever, all the out- things that you can't control, you have to control your routine and your habits. And, and obviously this is more like in-game stuff, but same goes for pre-game, same goes for post-game. Like regardless of your performance, my um, Mental Sweat Monday I just put out is you want to evaluate yourself post-game the same way, whether you have a good game or a bad game. Because it's so easy to evaluate a bad game, right? Like what's everything you did wrong? But then we have a good game and we're like, hey, good game, folks. Like we played great today. See you later. And it's like, hold on. We're not that evaluating. What, yes. uh, right. We're not, how are we going to continue to get better if we're not evaluating and dissecting what we did to perform well? Like it's like a no brainer, but we don't do it. Cause we're like, Ooh, huh, day's done. We performed well on to the next one. But then the next day we perform poorly and we stay in the dugout or the locker room for two hours post game, trying to figure out what the heck went wrong instead of what the heck went right. And so I think it's, it's kind of all combined and that's a super long answer to that question, but no, I think habits and routines are what create the consistency and the focus and the concentration that we all are trying to achieve on a daily basis. Oh my God. I love that answer. You were like, that's a long answer. I'm like, that was the perfect answer. Let's be real. <laughs> um, that's so good. So you mentioned mental sweat Mondays and they I think are the first time I actually was introduced to you, which I think most people, that's kind of how people get introduced to you. Yeah. Um, but you've been doing these for about a year and a half ish. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Started um, January of 2019. That's so awesome. What, in, well, I guess I should tell people what it is. It's basically, <laughs> and you could probably tell it way better than me, but it's a minute of fire and inspiration and motivation. <laughs> and I love that they love come that. on Mondays because what better? Um, but yeah. you, you basically, you know, tell people what mental skills coaching is in mm-hmm. a minute and how you can kind of do it for yourself and really take ownership of your thoughts. Um, I know yeah. you can describe it 10 times better than I just did, yeah. um, but that was kind of my take on it. So what inspired you to do these, you know, you started in January, so maybe it was like one yeah. of those things that you commit <laughs> to and see what happens, you know, yeah. but yeah, what inspired so- you to do them? Yeah, it kind of came um, pretty naturally. So um, I was about a year in um, with the Phillies and it like it was kind of starting to build some traction. And, you know, everybody was like, what's a mental performance coach, right? It's, it's a different word than sports psychologist. It's, it's different than like what a lot of people have heard. So my initial reason to do it was to create awareness around what is mental performance coaching? Like, what do I do? What conversations do I have with different types of performers? Um, and just kind of educate the general public of what mental performance coaching is. Um, and then the second part that I think it's more towards now, because I think people are starting to understand it, um, is to help. So, so the name is Mental Sweat, right? And, and mm-hmm. if you look at social media, even now, and this was a year and a half ago, right? Two years ago, um, it, we're inundated with physical sweating, right? Like you have to get a physical sweat in every day to be this perfect holistic version of you, right? You got to sweat, you got to do yoga, you got to run, whatever it is, you got to move every day, which I think is awesome. And I don't want to take anything away from that. But just as important as getting a physical, physical sweat in is making sure we're getting a mental sweat in too, and making sure we're checking on our mental performance too. And so that's kind of where the name came from, which my husband helped me come up with. It's like, the way I want you to value this is just as important as the physical aspects of performance and you and getting better and getting stronger and staying healthy is what I want you to compare the mental performance side to. I want you to be breaking a mental sweat every day. And so 
um, instead of doing it every day, we, mm -hmm. I do it once a month or once a week, every Monday. And it's basically to give you any tips or tricks or um, challenges to just think about, okay, how am I working on my mental performance today and this week um, and, and challenging myself and whether it's just checking in upstairs and seeing how you're doing or whether it's actually giving you a tangible thing to actually put into place that week um, and to try and, and again, to kind of build awareness around what is mental performance, but also you start implementing it yourself um, because it's so important. And we, we prioritize all of these things and it's so easy to forget the importance of the mental aspects of, of performance, but also of your life. And, and I always say, you know, this isn't just for elite level athletes, because if you are a human being, if you are a parent, if you are a spouse, if you are, if you have a job, you are performing in some way, shape or form. If you have a podcast, you are performing, right? And so to me, everybody can get better from mental sweat because we're all performing in some way, shape or form. And it's for all types of performers. So it's not just for elite level athletes. It's for, it's for the everyday person to, to make sure you're getting a mental sweat and not just a physical sweat on a daily basis. I love that. I love that, yeah. especially because when you think about it, you know, now that we're not playing our sport anymore, we all have our own type of game days, you know, mm -hmm. like me interviewing you today. It's like my game day. I'm super hype. I'm super yeah. pumped. I made sure love I did it. my morning routine. So I was ready love for it. this. Um, Consistency. Lit legitimately, I was just about to commend you for the fact that you've been so consistent with them. And it's just like, it's so fun seeing it evolve from where it started to where it is now. And people just yeah. cannot get enough of these. And I just love that you're talking about goal setting. You're talking about breath work. You're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, posture and how that implements performance. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you could pick a favorite mental sweat Monday, mm -hmm. I mean, shoot, mm -hmm. I don't know if you can. But if I you got it. A okay. So basically just give <laughs> us, give us a sample mental sweat Monday. <laughs> I love it. So podcast. my favorite, and it's funny because people always ask me like, if you had to give one skill, what would it be? And my answer is the same for everybody, whether it's grandma, grandpa, whether it's major league baseball player, whether it's just a human being, um, it's present moment. It's to get into the present moment. And so one of the, my favorite things, here, I'll freaking draw it out. I don't care. Okay. I love it. YouTube right. is the only one who's going to see notes. this. Notes, <laughs> notes. So um, think about the present moment. The way you think about the present moment is you have three moments in time, right? Three, three different times, right? You have what? You have past. Can you see this? Past. It's going to be backwards, but whatever. That's okay. Present and future, right? You have past, present, and future. Those are the three moments in time. Where in time can your brain be? Where can your mind be? All of them, right? Yeah, anywhere. Your brain can be in the future. Your brain can be right here, right now, which I hope it is. Um, or your brain can be in the past, right? Where in time can your body be? Present. Only in the present moment, right? Yeah, that's it. Only in the present moment, right? So the only place your mind and your body can actually be together is in the present moment. And don't you agree that in order to perform your best, your mind and your body have to work together? Mm -hmm. No doubt, right? So for our mind and our body to work together, the only place they can work together is the present moment. So you got to get into the present moment. Oh, that's, that's so fire. I love that. That's my favorite. That's my favorite because, and it's like the cyclical process, right? If you're in the present moment, you're performing better, right? If you're, if you're too busy worried about what you're going to eat for dinner right now or lunch or breakfast, but you're listening to this podcast, you're not in the present moment. You're not getting the most out of it. You're not enjoying this the most you possibly can. But if you are in the present moment, you're listening, you're engaged, you're excited, and you're, you're just better at whatever you do in the present moment. Think about it. If you're in a conversation with somebody and you're in the present moment, you're a better listener. You're a better friend. You're a better significant other. You're a better parent if you're with your kids and you're in the present moment. And, and it's one of the hardest things in the world to do, especially right now with all of the outside stuff constantly coming into just computer, right? I have two computer screens, my laptop, my phone right here, like within inches of my face, right? I have a TV out there, right? It's, it's so much going on that we're so rarely in the present moment. And it's sad because the best stuff comes out of the present moment. And which goes back to my definition of mental toughness. When you're able to focus on the right thing at the right time, usually you're focusing on the present moment, right? You're not, you're not stressing about what already happened and the hits you gave up or the runs that were scored but you're also not worried about what you're about to do. You're right here right now, which is able, which gives you the ability to perform your best. So I always like 
I, it's my number one thing I work on all the time is being, I, I'm a horrible mental skills coach if I'm not in the present moment. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like I'm not listening to you. I don't care what you're saying. I'm like, I got other things to do. Right. I'm a horrible mental performance coach if I am not in the present moment. And mm. so like, that's a daily check-in for me is like, and, and now like, and then you come, you become really aware of it and you're in a conversation. You're like, Oh gosh. Like you start to realize like, I'm not where I need to be. How do I lock back in? Right. How do I get back mm. into this moment? And, 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 it's exhausting. It's mentally so draining to be in the present moment, which is why I think we avoid it. And why yeah. I think it's, it's, it's more difficult to be in the present moment than it may be to be in other places. Um, Cause it's easy to complain. It's easy to whine. It's easy to do all these. It's really hard to like focus on what you need to be focused on. And in this moment, even though better things come when we do it, it's not the easiest thing, which is why we typically aren't in it. And so we actually have to work really, really hard to get into the present moment. Um, so that's my, without a doubt, by far my favorite and, and one of my favorite things that and confidence. So it's a, it's a close call. I love it. Um, so it's funny when you were describing that, I was thinking of an actual example from a hitter's perspective. So sometimes I work with hitters and they, before they actually see the barrel make contact with the ball, they're looking up. And like, this is just an analogy I was thinking of. And it's like, well, you yeah. can't hit the ball off the barrel of the bat unless you're seeing it happen first. And if mm -hmm. your head's already looking towards where you want to hit the ball mm -hmm. at the same time, you're not going to be able to hit the ball. Like you're, you're either barely going to touch it, which would be a miracle if you actually got a hit, but it's like, you're focused on the future instead of where you're ac actually at right now. And a lot of times hitters, they kind of get into that mindset of, um, you know, maybe what happened in the past or what you need to do in the future. And you add that extra pressure when in reality, it's just you and the ball. And if you can just be in sync with that, that present moment, you're, uh, you're probably going to be a lot more successful. Yeah, um, exactly. But Perfect that's so example. good. That's so good. I what love are you, that. Right. And, and just asking yourself, what are you supposed to be focusing on when you're in the box? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, what is the one thing you want to focus on when you're in the box? And, you know, hopefully that's an external cue. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully it's the ball and not worrying about what's about to happen or what happened in your last at bat. Um, but it's hard. It's hard to do that in the heat of the moment when the pressure of the game's on, when people are yelling, fake crowd noises in the crowd, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's really hard to do. And, but, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. And I think that's just the moment where, as a coach, I, I always try to tell them, like, pick one thing on the bottle, stare at. Pick the red seams. Just yeah. stare at the red seams. Because if you're staring and you're very intentional about your focus on the red seams, then all of those external things that you just mentioned, they're not even a factor. Exactly. Um, yeah. Was it for the love of the game where he talks about, you know, um, what's, what, shoot, what was, what was this phrase? Um, oh gosh. Mm, crap. I should have been more prepared with this one. <laughs> um, shoot. What does he say? Oh, he's pitching and he's staring at the catcher. I know, I know we know this game. We, we know this phrase. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Um, I'm going to Google it real fast. Kind of. This is where we'll have to edit this out later. Um, okay let's look what's it called for the love of the game yeah quotes because it was a, like when he would want to just focus on the catcher and stare at the catcher um yeah Billy, this is so bad that i can't remember this this is like one of those like brain farts that you have that you hopefully never have but oh god here it is oh clear the mechanism that's what it says. That's what he says. So when he's on the mound and he's, okay. and there's like a ton of people in the stands, his, you know, power on the mound is always being able to clear out whatever's going on. So they give it. an example of it. So I'm surprised you haven't seen it. Cause it's like uh -uh. a perfect analogy. I've seen, I think I've seen bits and pieces of this game. Yeah. But I, this is not wrong. I'm not remembering it. Clear the yeah. mechanism. Clear the mechanism. So when he says it, it all of a sudden, everybody around him fades, even, I think even the batter might fade. I'm not quite sure but it's just him and the catcher. And so it's, it. that's literally the most focused you can be in that situation. And that's why he was, I think the whole story is he's like the oldest pitcher in the league or something. Okay. And the reason why he's so good isn't because he's like physically the best fit. It's because he's right. the most focused. So I that's one it. thing that I love about that, that movie. Um, I are, love there it. Any, are there any sports movies that you're like obsessed with because they basically relate to you so much when you watch them? Um, oh, that's a good question. This might be hard. I, um, 
I mean, Tin Cup is just a classic. Oh my um, gosh. So I good. mean, a classic. So good. Um, I love Bull Durham. Both mm-hmm. of those are kind of in my same um, wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, well, this isn't a movie, but um, The Last Dance um run and go watch it if you haven't watched it oh my gosh um, yes. especially the last episode um or the last two episodes i think um so good and like so many solid um mental performance cues and like mm-hmm. and that's a thing like you hear mental performance things all the time but sometimes like it's like wow yeah it's so mentally tough does all these things like such in the present moment did you have to listen and like actively listen and like hear it and like own that like that is mental performance, right? Like some people, some people don't have to train as hard, but some people do have to train hard. And so mm-hmm. I think that's, that's so important. Like when you're watching things like that, like look for what, what they're doing to be better mentally. And like, there's so many pieces that you hear and you're like, oh yeah, yeah. Just like be mentally tough. But like, what the heck does that mean? And like, how do you become mentally tough? Right. I think that's a huge piece. So like, I think in most sporting, like if you have, I I said this to somebody the other day, I was like, if you have a conversation with somebody about baseball and the hardships of baseball and the struggles of baseball in the baseball world, like 99% chance something mental is going to be brought up. And like, I love that because it's like, so what are you doing about the mental aspects of their game? Are you just ripping a thousand balls off the tee every day? Like, what are we doing about the mental aspect? Maybe it's nothing to do with your physical game. Maybe it's all mental. And that can be trained. And there's people who do that and like, go ask, go get help with that, right? Go grow and become better with that. Um, But I think so often people just mention it and there's not really anything to follow that or to back that up or or they're not doing anything about it. And I'm like, come on, like it's right here in front of you. So Mm -hmm. uh, that just sparked that thought. Man, I mean, you mentioned the last dance and I have pages upon pages of notes that I would take. I, one, I, I decided, so you do mental sweat Mondays every day. I do a live every day um, on Instagram yeah. and Facebook. And so I devoted every single one of those Mondays after, was it six weeks of episodes of the last dance or maybe five, um, maybe eight, one, five, I think 10, 10 episodes. So five. Yeah. Okay. So five weeks. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I would take all these notes and I would like talk about it the next day. But I think one of my favorite things that I took away from it was how Michael would, he would make up stories about the other team bashing him you know sometimes they were true sometimes it was somebody on the team yeah. was you know saying too much or just basically saying you know michael's not as good as he thinks he is something like that but he'll make even he will make up stories so that he can like turn on his internal flame and yeah. just kill it on the field yeah. and i just thought that was Love so it. funny because whenever i played against um you know top 10 opponents in college so like UCLA, Arizona, just the best teams in the country. I played it at, at Purdue. So we were like middle of the Big Ten. Yeah. When we'd play them, I'd kind of do the same thing. So yeah. I, I would think to myself, you know, this team thinks we're nothing. This team thinks that we're not going to do anything. And I kid you not, my best performances were against those teams. Mm-hmm. And I think it was because of like that similar aspect of I was like, oh, so Michael did what I did. I just did it in a different way. Yeah. But we can learn so much from documentaries like The Last Dance and, oh my goodness. you know, movies. It's like, I'm a movie fanatic. Yeah. I, I love it. If I can choose, you know, people are like, what are your hobbies? I love going to the movies. Like, I love, I love popcorn. Like, I, I, I could go too. to a movie Same. just, just to get movie theater popcorn. Facts. I think I remember you actually putting up a tweet during quarantine. Yeah. It's Same. what I miss the most. Yes, that you couldn't get your Literally. popcorn at movie theaters. Literally, it's what Same. I miss the most. Same. Yeah. But I think I, I'm a movie junkie just because, like, even from Disney movies, I, I like, I get this excitement and, like, yeah, I don't know. It's just, like, I can relate somehow to it. And so I love I it. Know. But I, I'll, I'll say this, too. Like, Michael Jordan, like, I hope, like, people need to realize that that's what he did and that's what you did that worked for you, which is mm-hmm. awesome. And so it's almost like take that and figure out what works for you. Maybe that exact thing works for you like it did for you. Maybe it's a rendition of that, right? But it, the, the key to that is he found what he needed to get him in the right mind space and he did it all the time. Mm. And so figure out one, what is your right mind space, right? Is it like super hype? Is it super calm? Is it somewhere in the middle? And then two, figure out what you have to do to get yourself into that mindset before competition. And that comes from trial and error, right? Mm -hmm. That's like, okay, once I figure out my mindset now, 
okay, I'm going to try to listen to hype music. Well, I didn't play great today. I don't think that's really put me in the right mindset. Right. Or, um, you know, whatever I, I did uh, mindfulness meditation before I did a focus exercise before I did imagery before, and I see good results when I do this. Um, or I feel like I'm in a good headspace, even though I didn't have great results today, I felt like my headspace was fire. So I'm going to keep doing this. And I think this will put me in the best chance of success. So it's like, figure out what, what, mind space you have to be in and then two like know how to get yourself there when you're not because most of the time you're not and then three know what to do when you can't get to that mindset because you can't always get there and so you got to be able to play when you're not at your best mentally right just like you got to play when you're not at your best physically right and basketball is a great example when your shot's off what are you told to do keep shooting like keep shooting and go play good defense right yeah. like don't yeah. stop shooting get your butt back and go play defense right mm -hmm. and so it's like just because one aspect's off, like make an adjustment, right? Like, like it doesn't have to ruin your whole performance, but I think that's, I think that's super important is how do, how do you handle it when you're off? Yeah. Um, yeah. Until you don't have it because you're not going to have it some days. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to journaling. I mean, straight up, if mm -hmm. you can actually, you know, maybe spend seven days or spend 30 days going over, you know, when you have your best performances and when you have your worst, like a lot of times yep. you can find what it is that led to the best and led to the worst. And, and that can come from, you know, the routines or the habits that you did before your performance. And I'm like, I'm yeah. talking about ways that help me get here and me, you know, learn how to be my best too. So man, I mean, we could keep talking for hours, but <laughs> I, I mean, so there's so many other things that I could ask you, I guess I'm just going to have to have you on the podcast at another time too. Mm -hmm. So we can just, you we'll know, do it tackle Comment. specific things. I know I my audience it. is going to love you so much. Um, but if I'm going to ask you one more question and then I'm going to give you like quick five questions that you have That's to answer great. within like five seconds. Um, no pressure. I love it. But this I last one is if you could choose, you know, one common theme between the best athletes that you work with, um, that they do mentally that actually make them very, very good at what they do. If you can pick one common theme, that the best have, what would that be? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of how I've answered this in the past. I'm not going to think about that. I'm going to be in the present moment and I'm going to think <laughs> about what is the common theme. Um, okay, I got it. It is, they are both their biggest critic and their biggest fan. Mm. So like, uh, right. I want you to be your biggest fan, right? You've got to be able to pat yourself on the back when you perform well. But I also think the best of the best are their biggest critics, right? They don't get to the big leagues just by winging it, right? They get to the big leagues knowing there's always ways to improve. There's always something I want to be working on, right? They are their hardest critic. Like their parents and their guardians are hard on them, but they're harder. Um, but they can still take a step back and say, Hey, good work today. They can be proud of the job that they do when they do it because so often, and that's how burnout occurs, right? If, if you're never happy with your performance and you're always critical, you're going to burn out. You're going to hate the game that you once loved, and you're not going to enjoy anything you do, which remember enjoyment equals better performance. So if we're not enjoying it because we're not performing well, we're going to continue to not perform well because we don't enjoy it. Right. And we're going to enjoy it even less, which means we're going to perform even worse. And so it's like, we have to find this balance between almost like competing like hell, but also enjoying like hell too. Um, and, and rejoicing in the good, but also like holding ourselves accountable on the bad. And it's, it's finding that balance, which is really hard. And, you know, some big leaguers are like, I can't enjoy anything, right? I have to grind. Like I have to keep getting better. And I think the best of the best are able to do both, are able to celebrate the little things but also hold them accountable on the little things too. Mm, so good. And it's sad because yeah. I think a lot of people are going to hear that and only think of be your biggest critic because I can, you have Facts. to, right? Facts. But like, they don't think about the fact that you have biggest to act, fan piece. be your biggest fan at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's like a balance. Mm -hmm. balance piece. Or you're going to like, or you're literally going to burn yourself into the ground and like, Ugh. hate. you're going to, because nothing's ever going to be good enough. You are never going to be good enough. You're never going to be perfect. So you're never going to be happy. Like what, mm. what are we doing? what are we doing? Come on. What are we doing? Like, so, yeah. so the thing you once love this game, right. That we play, we don't work. We don't work baseball. We play baseball, right. We play sports. Now you hate it. Like, and, and that happens. That is so real. And so think about the best of both worlds is literally holding yourself to a high standard, but also having the best time of your life while you're doing it, which is really hard to do. Mm. Really hard to do. And you're having the time of your life. 
I can just see it. I can just, yeah, it's amazing it's important. following. Yeah, it, it truly is. Um, okay. So before I ask you the five to thrive questions, I want to thank you yeah, tremendously for being mm-hmm. on this podcast, because I think every single minute of this podcast, there was some, something bomb that came <laughs> out of your mouth. So I love if it. people weren't <laughs> taking notes again, like re-listen to this episode, re-listen to this or go on YouTube and watch it. Watch us have this conversation live. Yeah. I say I live, it. but it's just like, it's not live. It's whatever. just video, it's, whatever. It's kind of live. <laughs> it was live for us. It was live for us. That's all that matters. Um, <laughs> so if people want to check out your mental sweat Mondays, if they want to check out you and what you're up to, where's the best platform to find you? Yeah. So, um, I post mental sweat Mondays on Instagram. Um, and my username is just Hannah Huseman. So first and last name. And then I also post them on Twitter and it's Hannah underscore Huseman, I believe. And I'm on LinkedIn too. If, if anybody's on LinkedIn too. Um, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Those are, those are it. Yeah. I love it. And I'll make sure I put all of our information in the show notes after this episode as well. Um, okay. With that, you're definitely going to be on the podcast again before. Love it. I it's, love it's it. happening. This is amazing. And did I, did I hear you might be starting your own podcast at some point? I don't know. We'll see. Mm, okay. TBD. 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 Determined. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm excited. I'll let you know though. You'll be one of the first <laughs> to know if I do. Oh, heck yes. I'm pumped. <laughs> I'm pumped. I love it. Okay. So here's your five to thrive questions. Um, okay. Try to answer this within, I would say like two sentences at most. We may continue okay. Just try oh, to keep it short and go with like your gut. That's basically the whole okay. point. Got to add a little Got pressure because you know we're athletes. I love it. Um, pressure is a privilege, right? <laughs> it is. All yeah. right. First question. What's your favorite thing about being a mental skills coach? Seeing people who think they don't need it all of a sudden realize that they do need it and buying into it completely. Mm, money. I love That's that. my favorite. Yeah. Who was your biggest role model growing up or who is one? Definitely my mom. Mm. She just, well, she, I I didn't say this earlier, but she was a clinical psychologist. Um, So she's kind of like the older version of me and like everybody always wanted to talk to her and now everybody wants to talk to me, but now I get to do it in sports. And so we have a pretty close bond when it comes to that. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. She's probably so proud of you too. She She's is. your biggest She's fan. Awesome. <laughs> she definitely is. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh. I love that. All right. Mm. If you have to think about this one, I'm, I'll give you some time. But your okay. favorite sports quote? Uh, um, it's, it's the one Kobe Bryant. Um, hold on. I'm going to pull it up because I don't want to butcher it. That's why. It's pinned on my Twitter if you follow me on Twitter. Mm. Um, okay. It says, it's not about the number of hours you practice. It's about the number of hours your mind is present during the practice. Mm. Kobe Bryant. Mm-hmm. Man. Once Ugh. again, present moment. But that, like, think about that. Like, who, who cares how many numbers of hours you practice? But if you weren't present during the practice, if it wasn't meaningful and purposeful practice, it's a waste. Oh my gosh. And maybe you could cut your practice hours in half if they were present moment practice hours versus just like, mindless practice hours, right? Exactly. Too many people are like, oh, I have to practice for an hour. Um, you don't have right. to practice an hour a day. You can get yeah, right. some good work in in 15 minutes. Facts. Facts. Exactly. Yeah. I love there that. What is one thing you wish you could tell your college self that you know now that you wish you would have had when you played? Um, I love this question and I've answered this before. It's mm-hmm. create your own confidence. Ooh. You can't like the confidence that you're constantly looking for is not going to come from your mom. It's not going to come from your dad. It's not going to come from your coaches, from significant others, from your friends. The real confidence that you're looking for, which I am lucky enough to have found is within you. Mm. If you want to be confident, you have to create it for yourself. And I wish I would have learned this when I was like eight years old, but um, that's what I would tell former me and all, all athletes and people heck of all ages is, you want to be confident, you create it for yourself. Stop looking for confidence in other people because you're not going to find it. And you may find it like little pieces here and there. And that's what makes you think you should always be searching for it from other people. But the reality of it is when you need it the most, it's they're, they don't know that. It, they may not be there. And the only person who's always with you is you. So if you can create that feeling for yourself, like how often is that? So, Amen. That is so good. Mm-hmm. Oh, 
I love that. Okay. All right, last question. Are you ready? Okay. Yeah. Who's your favorite pro, ba pro baseball player and why? I'll give you a little bit more time because, I mean, I said two sentences, but I need a why. Mm, um, well, I'm not going to pick a current because uh, that's illegal. Um, no, <laughs> but um, I'll probably say Jeter um, mm. just because, like, I always watched him and thought he was such a stud. And, like, not only was he, like, good on the field, but I always thought he was, like, he was the one who was always hustling and always grinding and, like, doing the things that he could control. And I don't think I realized that that's why I liked him. Mm -hmm. um, but, and just like his, his just outlook on life and baseball. And like, it was always fun to watch him. He was literally competing his ass off, but also having a hell of a time, like yeah. a, a good time. At least it looked like it, you know, yeah. um, on the surface. So um, I think that's, that's who I'm going to go with Jeter yeah. for sure. He definitely left it all on the field, man. Mm -hmm. and, and just the fact that his career ended the way it did as well. It's like, are you kidding? Like, nobody are, of course it did. But of course right. it did. Like, of course it did. You know? Yeah. Enjoying it. I know. I know. I love that. Who's your favorite? Ooh. So I grew up, like I said, a Cubs fan. And watching, you know, Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire just, mm -hmm. like, compete. That Mark, was always – Mark McGuire's on my list, too. Yeah. They were just so fun to watch. And, again, yeah, like, love loved the game, loved competing. Love that, would, that was, like, the first one to come to mind. I have so many others that I could probably say, too. Um, I love it. Like currently I'm obsessed with Javi Baez in his hands. Like just love it. He's amazing. And the fact that he's come <laughs> so far as a hitter is just so it's like fun to watch too. I love it. Yeah. So that's, that's even a, more fun. Of mine. I know. I know. All right. You know, well, thank you so, so much yeah. for, for just spitting fire today. This was so amazing. <laughs> Crazy to think that this was like our first time actually meeting each other as well. I know now that, now there that I'm know. thinking about it um that's why I know that you're definitely going to be a, a future guest <laughs> again <laughs> come on um I would love to but this was so so much fun thank you so so much for being here heck yeah you're welcome thanks for having me it was a blast